<clears throat> it dawns on me since we uh, finished our with a worship song that was actually part of the uh, synagogue liturgy that our Torah service uh, wasn't all that different from what you would experience if you went to a traditional synagogue except there were a number of prayers that we said only in the English that they would say uh, in the Hebrew as well. Uh, now some synagogues do only the Hebrew which shortens it a little bit uh, but the uh, reform uh, tend to want people to understand what is being said in the Hebrew, and that's certainly what we do in our congregation, and so you would have both the Hebrew and the um, translation. Also, um, I was hoping to, uh, well, let's see, I think two weeks ago, uh, almost two weeks ago, um, I announced the birth or the birth of my 10th grandchild took place. And uh, for that reason, we were trying to give uh, mom of now seven a break. Uh, and we had four of her children uh, here this week. Um, they actually went up to uh, Gatlinburg. And uh, we're going to come to the service tonight. Uh, and that would have been a tremendous blessing. However, uh, we had a little bit of a fever issue with a couple of them today and we have a, a policy in the congregation and we felt like it was good if the rabbi's family uh, abided by it that when we're not well we stay home uh, and that's worked out really well um, during the pandemic uh, and uh, that and the fact that we asked the Lord um, to provide a hedge of protection for his people as we come together in worship and we trust uh, that he is able to bless us in that way. It's not guaranteed, uh, but it is uh, a blessing uh, that we have experienced uh, in large part in the congregation to the point that we have had no situation where somebody came to the congregation uh, and um, later found out they had COVID and ended up giving it to somebody else. So that's uh, really been the, the favor of the Lord. Uh, we've also been experiencing the favor of the Lord in, a, in our efforts to get a building in Greenville. And I've been kind of downplaying and saying we're in the initial stages. Well, now we're in the home stretch. Uh, things have progressed and uh, we've been able to overcome uh, every uh, challenge or issue that has come up. Uh, and I am hopeful that in the next week or two, we will be announcing uh, that we've set a, a closing date to actually purchase the building. So your continued prayer uh, and favor for our opportunity to be able to worship uh, sometime in 2023 uh, a lot closer to the Jewish community as we seek to bring the message of the Jewishness of Messiah. Uh, that sounds almost like a... a, a um, inconsistency it doesn't make any sense the messiah is a jewish concept and yet uh these days we have to bring the message of the messiah first of all uh to our jewish people and how we see uh the role of the messiah uh being fulfilled in messiah yeshua both in his first coming uh, as the suffering servant that the rabbis call mashiach ben yosef uh, and as we look forward to his soon return uh, when every knee will bow, when every uh, tongue will acknowledge him as Lord, and he says he is not coming back until the Jewish people say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if you continue to come to congregation, you'll hear that in songs enough that you'll be able to um, say it along with us. But we trust uh, that this service will be a blessing to you tonight. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, uh, Lord, uh, as your uh, servants, Lord, uh, we just come before you this evening seeking revelation, Lord, uh, from your word, how we can serve you in a greater way, how we can have a greater understanding uh, of our calling, Lord, uh, how we can see the experiences that you have provided in our lives. Uh, how we can see the gifting that you have uh, provided as the way uh, that you intend to use us for your purposes. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. I ask these things, uh, my rock and my redeemer, I ask these things in the name of uh, my Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Last week, we started the second book of the Torah, uh, the book of Exodus which is called what in the Hebrew? Uh, 
Shemot, which means names. And speaking of names, Moses asked the Lord his name because he thinks that that is going to help him uh, to convince the Israelites that he had been chosen by the Lord to lead them out of their bondage in Egypt. They have been in bondage for so long that they just can't imagine anything else. Uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, when we find out that the Lord is doing something, we struggle to figure out, is, is this uh, simply the Lord uh, demonstrating his power, uh, performing a miracle in my life, or is this me wishing it would happen so bad that I feel like <coughs> this is what the Lord is, is doing? So the Lord, um, uh, when Moses asked the Lord his name, the Lord responds, Say to the people of Israel, this is Exodus 3, verses 14 and 15 uh, from last week's portion, uh, Adonai, uh, the, uh, Elo, Adonai Eloheinu, Velohe uh, Avotechem, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Velohe Yaakov, Yod Hey Vav Hey, this is the translation. The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered generation after generation. And in the scriptures, we see the revelation that we are a forgetful bunch. And the Lord has uh, provided ways to help us to remember his blessings, to remember all that he has done for us. Uh, he's provided the seven annual appointed times uh, and the weekly appointed time of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, uh, as we are observing tonight. And as we uh, chanted earlier in the Vishamru from Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, the weekly Sabbath is a sign that helps us to remember that the Lord created uh, the heavens and the earth in six days and on the seventh day, he established the Sabbath. Last week's portion uh, also started out telling us that there arose in Egypt a king who did not know Joseph. And if we had some music in the background, it would be a little uh, troubling, a little uh, suggesting that something uh, bad was about to happen. Because this new pharaoh is taking steps to minimize the size of the Jewish population. First by enslaving them and oppressing them. And then attempting uh, to even uh, perhaps eliminate them completely by having all Jewish male babies drowned right after they are born. Eventually, no male Israelites uh, and the um, Jewish people would come to an end. Except that the Jewish mid midwives refused to obey this instruction. The Lord later reveals to Moses at the burning bush, and it starts out as the Malach Adonai, the messenger of the Lord, but then later it is yud heh vav uh, the covenant representation of the Lord in the four Hebrew letters that we uh, don't really know how to pronounce, so we substitute uh, Adonai, uh, which is a Hebrew word that means my great Lord. Um, he reveals himself and he gave Moses three miracles to perform <coughs> to help convince the people in addition to what his name is. This is what the Lord said you should use to help the people to understand. Now I mentioned two of them last week, uh, but I forgot to mention that there was a third miracle. It, it says the first miracle should convince them but if it doesn't, the second miracle should take care of it. The first miracle, um, what was the first miracle? Let's see if y'all remember, because uh, I'll remember it in a second. Um, the second one was, was making his hand um, have the sara'at. Oh, the first one, I, yeah, I heard y'all say it. Maybe it's that I don't want to remember the snake. It's, it's the staff uh, going on the ground and, and turning into a snake. And that's pretty good, but then it turns back into a staff. That's even better. Um, and then the third one <coughs> was to, uh, it says, the second one ought to convince them, but here's the third one as well. The Lord really wants the people to know that this is his plan. I mean, this is one of the most spoken events 
uh, in the entire scriptures, particularly the Hebrew scriptures. God reveals himself as the God who is able to bring deliverance to his people who are enslaved by the most powerful nation in the world at that time. We also see a picture of the deliverance that he provided to all who would call upon the name of Yeshua as he delivers us out of our bondage to sin. Uh, as we are enslaved um, by the uh, dominion, the authority of this world. And uh, the only way of escape is the deliverer, Yeshua. Uh, the Lord has provided for us um, so that we can have uh, for li forgiveness for our sins and we can be delivered from our bondage to our sins. So now it's time, as we read earlier, for Moses and Aaron to approach uh, th this particular Pharaoh uh, as we find in this week's Torah portion, Va'era, which means, and I appeared. As the Lord tells Moses, starting in Shemot, Exodus 6, verse 2, that he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, uh, normally translated as God Almighty. Uh, but he did not make himself known to them by the four Hebrew letters, yod Hey vav Hey. And there's been a debate on the rabbis forum in the last day or so uh, as to what this means. And there are varying views even within uh, Judaism because in Genesis 14, verse 22, Abraham referred to the Lord using this part of the name. So it doesn't mean that they were unaware of it, but it might mean that there will be a change in how the Lord manifests himself to his people. That while he had previously revealed himself as the God who could meet their needs, the God who is all sufficient, now he was going to reveal himself in an even greater way through a display of his awesome power over the most powerful nation and their gods in this world. In Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7, Moses is instructed to tell the people what the Lord is about to accomplish, represented traditionally in the four cups of wine at Passover. How many of y'all have been to one of our Passover seders or even any traditional Passover seder? Uh, the four cups of Passover. Uh, verse 6 says, I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians, rescue you from their oppression, and redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then finally in verse 7, the Lord says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. It's easy to take that for granted. Um, does anybody know a time later in the scriptures where we find those words? Actually, we find them in reverse. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, in the prophet Hosea, Hosea 1 verse 9. The Lord instructs Hosea to call his children by names that reflect his relationship with the Jewish people at that time. And I'll give you a hint. It's not going to be pretty. He tells Hosea to call his third child Lo-Ami. Lo means no. Am means people. Ami, my people. Lo-Ami, not my people. So we see the Lord revealing in the names of Hosea's children. The other two were called Lo Ruhama, no mercy or no pity, and Yezrael, God will scatter. The forsaking, here, so in these names, um, we see a description of the forsaking of the Jewish people by the Lord. And this seems really bad unless we keep reading. In Hosea 2, verse 23, and these verses are a little different in um, Jewish translations versus <coughs> non-Jewish translations. It's verse 25 in some. The Lord reverses the meaning of these names, saying, I have sowed her, meaning Israel, to me. I will have mercy on lo Ruchama, and I will say to lo Ami, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Now, there's one other place where we find this phrasing. Anybody know? Jeremiah 31. Uh, in a passage that begins in verse 31, a passage we cite often, uh, verse uh, 32, 
31 talks about uh, the day is coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The next verse says, for this is the covenant uh, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So here we see that the new covenant, the Brit Kadashah, the final renewal of all the covenants that were made with the Jewish people is a covenant of restoration for the Jewish people. Getting back to the Torah portion, after they're freed from their bondage, the Lord says in Exodus 6 verse 8 that he will bring them into the land that he swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So after Moses receives these promises, things are going to start improving right away, right? Y'all know how this thing goes. You've been coming long enough. We have this dialogue often, don't we? They now have to gather their own straw with no change in the quota of bricks that they're supposed to make. It seems like their situation has only gotten worse with Moses' efforts on their behalf. Now, is Moses doing what the Lord told him to do? Yes. And yet, uh, has their situation gotten better? No. Not yet, at least. And since Pharaoh isn't listening to him either, Moses again suggests to the Lord that he might have made a mistake in choosing him for this task. Remember, we saw him uh, questioning the Lord to the point that he got angry uh, in last week's portion. Chapter 7 starts with the Lord's words of encouragement to Moses. Our God is long-suffering. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many times we go to him, we complain, we do things wrong. He, he stands ready to have us realize uh, that he just wants us to have a relationship with him. He just wants us to desire uh, to be with him. Our Heavenly Father is very much like uh, the model earthly fathers should be where, um, you know, our, our children, they desire time with us. They desire uh, our blessing. And, and there are a lot of problems in relationships that occur because people were not able to receive their father's blessing for whatever reason. Uh, in some cases, they desire the, mo the mother's blessing as well, but, but there's this struggle of realizing that um, hopefully our fathers are good models of our heavenly father, demonstrating uh, unconditional love uh, and, and blessing us and encouraging us. And sometimes being brutally honest with us, just like uh, the Lord is with Moses, nonetheless, um, he continues to encourage him. In Exodus 7, verse 3, he gives him a heads up that he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. We will actually see several different Hebrew words used to describe the condition of Pharaoh's heart as he refuses to let the children of Israel leave. The more he refuses the more the Lord will have an opportunity to demonstrate his power through signs and wonders. I used to uh, struggle for the longest time. I've been a believer for over 40 years. Been uh, a, a, um, involved in the Messianic movement for over 30 years uh, and, and been a Messianic rabbi for over 10 years. Uh, and, you know, none of that matters except that I would struggle with the idea that the Jewish people were constantly rebelling against the Lord's ways. That when we read the scriptures, we see much more about their failures than their success. And I was trying to understand, you know, wh why did we have to, you know, record e every detail? Couldn't we have glossed over it a little bit? I mean, it it's a tough burden to try and explain to those who don't really have the picture. And when you can't explain it yourself, it's pretty hard to explain it to others. And I finally realized the more wayward the children of Israel are, the more God's faithfulness is demonstrated. And that's an encouragement to us. Because let's face it, this world is able to draw us away from the Lord. If, if we're honest about it, we frequently are wayward ourselves, perhaps some of us as much as the Israelites. 
And, and it's been my experience that many people who are giving in to the ways of this world or fighting this battle, and they're trying to do it by their own efforts. We call that self-righteousness. They, they are blind to any ways uh, that they are not doing what the Lord would have them to do. Uh, you know, the, the scriptures tell us um, that pride goes before a fall. We have to be very careful of that. We have to realize uh, that we are all works in progress. And uh, we should have compassion for others who are going through a struggle similar to ours. And we should offer encouragement. We can tell them where we have had the victory. Uh, and if we haven't had the victory, we can share that we are struggling in this area and perhaps they can uh, just say, I'll pray for you or I'll just, I'll be there for you. Uh, there's different ways that we can be a blessing to, to others in these types of situations. The Lord says um, that he is going to use the refusal of Pharaoh to demonstrate his power through uh, awesome, miraculous, powerful signs and wonders. The first term for the hardening of Pharaoh's heart is Akshet, uh, which is, you don't even need to write that one down because it's used only once here uh, and in a summary later in Exodus 13, verse 15. According to Strong's, it comes from a Hebrew root that means tough or severe. Now, the other two Hebrew terms we're a lot more familiar with <coughs> that are used to describe Pharaoh's heart. One is chazak. Uh, chazak means strong. Uh, and the other one is kaved, uh, similar to kavod, which is, uh, we translate as glory, but it has the idea that the Lord's glory falls because it's heavy. Kaved means heavy. And in this message, I will be translating um, the Hebrew uh, of these words in this way. Uh, in the complete Jewish Bible, the Congregational Bible that we use, Stern translates Akshah and Chazak as hard-hearted and Kaved as stubborn. Uh, in Exodus 7, verse 5, the Lord explains that through the deliverance of the Israelites, not only they, but as we heard earlier in our scripture reading, he wants the Egyptians to know that he alone is Adonai, is Lord. He wants the Egyptians likely representing the entire world, the rest of the world, so that ultimately all will know that he alone is the one true God. There is none else. Next, the Lord tells Moses that when Pharaoh asks for a miracle, Aaron is to throw his staff onto the ground. It will turn into a snake, uh, as we saw last week. Uh, in the uh, miracles that Moses was supposed to use to convince the Israelites. But then Pharaoh's magicians are able to do the same thing. Now, if I'm Moses or Aaron, I'm a little concerned unless I keep reading uh, or at least know what is yet to come uh, as Aaron's staff is going to gobble up the staves, uh, the, the staffs of the, other magi of the magicians. Now Pharaoh's probably the one who's concerned, uh, and he may have even been thinking, you know, maybe I should let the children of Israel go until we see in Exodus 7 verse 13 that Pharaoh's heart was strengthened, and he refuses to let the children of Israel leave. God planned to demonstrate his, for, his power over all the forces in this world, and Pharaoh would need to strengthen his own heart to strengthen his resolve to stand up to the Lord's power. Because of Pharaoh's refusal, we see the plagues begin as the Lord describes these events in Exodus 12, verse 12, as judgment over all the gods of Egypt. The first plague, blood, 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 right? As we say at Passover. All the rivers in Egypt turn to blood. But Pharaoh's musicians are able to do the same thing. His heart is heavy. And in his stubbornness, he refuses to let the Israelites go. Next comes the plague of frogs. And yet again, the magicians of Egypt are able to duplicate the feet. Once again, Pharaoh's heart is heavy. So the Lord then sends a plague of gnats or lice. Whichever one it, you want to translate the Hebrew, Pharaoh's magi magicians are unable to duplicate this plague uh, or any of the future plagues that will come. 
they tell Pharaoh it is the finger of God, meaning the plagues are from a God that is more powerful than they are, and probably more powerful than the gods of Egypt uh, is what they're thinking, though they may not want to say that. But still, Pharaoh's heart is described as strong as he continues to resist this God of the Israelites. Next, cue the flies or beetles. The animals, not the singing group, for the fourth plague. Uh, this plague aff afflicts the Egyptians, but according to Exodus 8, verse 22, the plague does not affect the Israelites in Goshen. And once again, it shows up as a different verse number because of the variation in verse numbering. Pharaoh tells Moses he can make his sacrifice to the Lord in Egypt. But Moses says he wants to go three days journey into the wilderness, Bamidbar. Pharaoh agrees, the plague stops, and then Pharaoh makes his heart heavy in his stubbornness. He does not let the people go into the wilderness. <coughs> Excuse me, following the fifth plague, a disease that afflicted the Egyptians' cattle, Pharaoh's heart is still described as heavy. He remains stubborn. He won't let the children of Israel go. And so then we have the sixth plague, the plague of boils. Pharaoh sees his magicians afflicted by the plague to the point that they cannot even come to him. But according to Exodus 9, verse 12, the Lord makes Pharaoh's heart strong. He continues to resist so that the Lord might continue to display his power. And we read earlier from Exodus 9, verses 14 through 16, For this time I will inflict my plagues on you yourself and on your officials and your people so that you will realize that I am without equal in all the earth. By now I could have stretched out my hand, struck you and your people with such severe plagues that you would have been wiped off the earth. But it is for this very reason that I have kept you alive to show you my power and so that my name may resound throughout the whole earth. God has revealed himself to the Jewish people, but their calling was to be a light to the nations, to enable the rest of the nations to see that God has chosen this particular group of people to demonstrate what happens when a people is obedient and faithful to their creator, uh, how they will be blessed, uh, how they will see um, prophecy fulfilled in their very midst. Um, the final plague that we will talk about, the seventh plague, is uh, the plague of hail, and fire and ice together are described as falling out of the sky. Now these are two contradictory forces in nature. Hail is balls of ice frozen water and fire, which should melt the ice, uh, are falling at the same time before Pharaoh's eyes. Every animal in the field, every person outside dies, and again Pharaoh says he'll let the children of Israel go. But after the Lord stops the plague, Pharaoh changes his mind, and once again, according to Exodus 9, verse 34, his heart is heavy, and in stubbornness he still refuses to let the people go. Now this is the place where the rabbis who uh, separate the Torah into portions such that we read it through uh, once uh, each year, uh, which normally that means we cover three or four chapters a week. This portion ends uh, right after the seventh plague, and so you'll have to come back next week uh, and see if Fred Scott will tell us in his message uh, whether Pharaoh's heart will soften enough to allow the children of Israel to leave Egypt. If not, it may even be two weeks. You, you might have to be persistent, but I suspect uh, that Fred won't leave us hanging. Uh, our New Covenant passage used the example of Moses and Pharaoh as a demonstration of the Lord's sovereignty. Uh, that's really the message of this passage. Uh, our God is king over all the earth. There is none who comes even close to comparing in Romans 9, verse 17, the Apostle Paul quotes Exodus 9, verse 16, where the Lord tells Pharaoh, it's for this very reason that I raised you up. The Lord is even able to raise up those who would oppress his people to accomplish his purposes, uh, so that in connection with you I might demonstrate my power, so that my name might be made known throughout the world. It is uh, natural... <laughs> I have even found myself uh, doing this in the past, 
uh, questioning what, why it's fair for the Lord to harden Pharaoh's heart, to predict it, uh, and then to actually have it say that he does it, uh, and then punish the Egyptians with the plagues. Paul addresses this saying, uh, concerning the Lord's sovereignty, the Lord will have mercy on whom he wants, and he will harden whom he wants. And the thing that we should zero in on, our question is about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, but the key is he will have mercy on those he desires to have mercy. And the reality is he has provided the way of mercy for all who would call upon the name of Messiah Yeshua. We did not deserve the sacrifice that he provided. We could not offer up sacrifices that would merit uh, forgiveness and enable us to change our ways. It is through a, a sacrifice that was offered up in the heavenly tabernacle on our behalf by his mercy that he chooses by his sovereign choice to make available to us. And questioning the Lord's purposes is basically saying, okay, here's how you should have done it. Uh, it, it. It is really an act of blasphemy. And the way Paul describes it is he takes uh, a, um, a, a concept that exists at that time of making clay vessels for use uh, in houses and even in uh, w for worship purposes. And he says, you know, our questioning the Lord is just like when the potter is molding the clay. If the clay were to say, wait a minute, why are you making me in this shape? And that sounds pretty ridiculous uh, when we describe it in that way. Um, but that's what Paul is saying we do when in our limited understanding, we question the one who knows everything, the one who is omniscient, all-knowing. That this analogy is actually first found in Isaiah 29, verse 16, um, where uh, Paul, we find as uh, frequently in his letters, when he makes an argument, he will base it uh, using verses that are found in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and so in reality, we won't understand the letters of Paul unless we un have a better understanding of the Hebrew scriptures. A lot of people believe none of that matters once Messiah came. But I would suggest that Paul would say to them uh, in the Hebrew, au contraire, mon frère. Um, <clears throat> good Hebrew, right? No, no. Ah, French. Yes, on the contrary, my friend. You, you have, uh, actually, the way Paul says it is me genoito, which is in the Greek. And it means, may it never be. It is the strongest uh, of negative terms. Paul asks in Romans 9, verses 23 and 24, What if the Lord did this to make known the riches of his glory to those who become the objects of his mercy, to all believers, both Jew and Gentile? Paul is pointing out that if we're going to ask what is fair concerning Pharaoh and the Egyptians, then we also should be asking, is it fair for God to show mercy to us when what we deserve is punishment? Paul's warning us that arguing with God over the issue of his fairness could be a huge mistake. Because according to Yehezkel, Ezekiel 18 verse 4, and Romans 6 23, all of us deserve, because of our sins, death. And it's only by God's grace that we don't suffer the death that we deserve. In other words, when it comes to the Lord's fairness, we better be careful what we ask for because we just might get it. Fortunately, God is full of grace and mercy. He understands that sometimes we uh, act in pretty foolish ways. But he loved us so much that he allowed his son to die on our behalf so that we might have the blood sacrifice that brings atonement. That is the ultimate demonstration of his mercy. That is why we can thank the Lord tonight, that we don't get the fairness that we so often demand. But as we saw uh, in our Haftar portion, um, Pharaoh is held accountable for his refusal to let the children of Israel go. Uh, Ezekiel, Yehezkel, that name means God is my strength. Chazak is actually in the name Hez, 
Kel um, <clears throat> in the way Hebrew names work. Uh, it's actually Chazakel. It gets combined. El is God, um, and then Chazak, strength, strong or strength. Um, <clears throat> and Yah means, means God as well. The Lord says that the Nile belongs to him, something that he proved in the first plague. Uh, but Pharaoh is proclaiming that the Nile belongs to him. So the Lord describes Pharaoh as some creature in the Nile, a crocodile, that he will bring into the wilderness. Remember, that's where the Israelite, where Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. That is where Pharaoh is going to go. Uh, and um, crocodiles need water. Otherwise, they will overheat, being a cold-blooded reptile. So if Pharaoh goes into the wilderness, he will die there and become food for the scavenging animals and birds. The Israelites will know that the Lord is God through his deliverance. The Egyptians will know that the Lord is God through this judgment of their leader, Pharaoh. Their land has become, it, it says, a desolation and a waste. And I think we're seeing something similar even in our day. Uh, most of us growing up, we knew who the leaders of Egypt were. They in exerted a lot of influence in the world. Um, today, I'm guessing if I asked, and I forgot to look this up, so I'll have to think about it. I think I might be able to come up with something close. Remember Anwar Sadat uh, and Hosni Mubarak? Uh, those are two former leaders of Egypt who uh, were involved in negotiating peace between uh, Israel and Egypt, Israel and um, the, the Palestinians. They, they would... Um, kind of uh, coordinate, intercede, oversee. Um, but anybody know who the leader of is, uh, Egypt is today? Yeah, I think that's close, uh, like Al-Sisi or, or something like that. But, but you never hear about them. Uh, Egypt's influence in the world in our lifetime uh, has reduced um, drastically. And if you'll remember, that was the place where the Arab Spring was supposed to have, have started. Uh, it, um, I guess about 15 years ago or so, and it's kind of all uh, fallen apart. And those who have uh, grown up and, and are much younger may not even remember those events. But tonight, we have seen a demonstration that our God, the God of Israel, is sovereign over all. And we've also seen that we do not seek fairness from the Lord. We go to him crying out, for his mercy and his grace so that we do not get the punishment that we deserve. And as I said, the ultimate demonstration of his grace is the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. And that's available to any who would call upon him tonight. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, you realize that you need to receive the grace that only God can provide for you tonight. You can say to the creator of the universe right now, I want my sins forgiven, and I desire for your spirit to guide my life. I am ready to place my eternity in your hands. Is there anyone that would say that prayer for the first time? All you have to do is raise your hand. You can put it right back down. It may be for somebody watching on this video later. Uh, you could raise your hand right now, just wherever you are watching this, uh, and, and I will trust that the Lord will bless you uh, in your desire to acknowledge his sovereignty, to receive his mercy and his grace. But for those of us who have already accepted Messiah's atonement for our sins, maybe you've been like the clay. You've been trying to tell the Lord how he should be running things. Or maybe you haven't trusted him in some area and you're ready to change that right now. Or maybe you need a miracle in your life right now, and you realize that the same God who demonstrated his miraculous power over all the gods of Egypt can show his power to you in whatever area it might be. So if you're ready to submit to the king of the universe, and you realize you need to stop telling him how to do things, or if you sense his leading and have desired to be obedient instead of making excuses, uh, like Moses did, or if you need a miracle in some area, once again, we would just ask you this time to raise your hand as a sign of your commitment 
to trust in him in this area that he has shown you. A number of hands going up. I believe that the Lord will see those hands and that he can provide the miracle that you need uh, as you can trust him for blessing uh, in your life. As Lord, you see the hands that were raised. And I pray that we would all acknowledge you as Melech HaOlam, the king of the universe, that your spirit would show us how you want to use us for your glory, to advance your kingdom, that your spirit would uh, help us to make your name known throughout the world as we humble ourselves in your sight. And we trust that you can use us. You can use our experiences. Uh, you can use the gifting that you have provided to us so that we might be able to uh, bring the message of your unconditional love to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Lord, we believe that you can perform the miracle that we need tonight. We desire that this would be in accordance with your will, that we would see miracles in our midst today uh, as we surrender to your sovereign will. And we seek this for our own lives, for the lives of our family, our congregation, our community, the lives of your people, Israel. And we ask these things in the name of Messiah Yeshua. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope that you will have a great week in Messiah.